So what I'm going to do before we sort of dive into Q&A is I'm going to offer up a few comments, um, hopefully in the interest of encouraging some, some conversation if it's not already encouraged enough. Um, throughout the course of the day, you've heard some comments with regard to market structure and regulatory structure and how you know, the correct or appropriate frameworks for both markets and regulation are necessary to promote development. Uh, of any resource, much less shale resources. Um, I would just like to echo that point. Um, <clears throat> I thought uh, uh, Anel's development cycle time slide was actually very informative uh, uh, in that regard. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we've enjoyed here in the United States uh, is a regulatory structure and a market structure that's very conducive to entry by small players. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, independent gas producers, not large oil and gas majors are really the predominant player in the oil and gas or in, the, in, the, in the gas industry in, in this country and that has a lot to do with the fact that uh, there are very very few barriers to entry um, and that in and of itself really does promote a lot of entrepreneurialship in the in the gas industry absent that uh, you know it'd be difficult to argue that we'd be having a conversation like this today um, because it's highly unlikely that uh, uh, you know, given the scale of, of shale developments, at least how they were viewed 10 years ago, that the majors would have taken the steps that a lot, a lot of the independents have. Um, so just put that on the table because it's, if you really want to think about promoting development at a, at a rapid pace, and I think Anel hit, hit the nail right on the head when she said it really is about production. You've really got to drive this process forward to be able to assess what you actually have and how long-lived it will be. Um, you know, a good example of how regulatory infrastructure and market infrastructure really benefited gas production in this country can be seen in the Barnett Shale. Um, there have been over 16,000 wells drilled, uh, horizontal wells drilled now in the, in the Barnett Shale, which is a staggering number when you just think about it. But um, um, what's interesting about that <clears throat> is that you can see if you look well by well, operator by operator, year by year, there's a tremendous amount of learning by doing that's occurring in that, sh in that particular play. Uh, just throw out a couple of numbers. In September of 2008, the average rig count per week in the Barnett uh, was 192. Okay, so it's a pretty healthy number. Uh, September of this year, 2011, this, the average rig, rig count per week in September was 64 a week. Production in September of this year was higher than production was in September of 2008. And you have to start to ask yourself, well, you know, what does that mean about rig efficiency? Well, it tells you, it actually tells you a lot because, A, you might say, well, it's not surprising the rig count dropped because operators were targeting more liquids-rich plays, and that's certainly true. But then you have to ask yourself the question, well, why was production higher? Well, it's because what you actually see when you look at the, the manner in which individual operators were attacking the acreage they owned, they did learn a lot. I don't have a slide to show you, but you can actually look at different operators. Wells drilled from 2005 to 2008 seem to sort of go in a scatterbrained direction when you're looking at the horizontal directions of the horizontals from uh, from the tops. Uh, but then you can see from 2009 to 2011, a lot of these operators are, are drilling their wells and they look like a railroad tracks. That tells you something. They learn something about the formation, and they're actually able to produce in a much more efficient manner. And so when you think about that lesson, and you think about how that lesson might actually carry over to other shales in North America and outside of North America, it really, I think, tells you a lot about the potential for shale globally. Um, the last comment I want to make has to do with storage, just to try to tie it all together. Um, you know, storage is a fantastic vehicle to promote arbitrage. Um, and when I say this, I mean in an inter intertemporal sense. And one of the things that struck me, and maybe you guys can comment on this, uh, our, our friends from Poland, um, is when you look at the location for the pro proposed salt dome uh, uh, development, <clears throat> you know, and you look at the fairway through which a lot of these shales or potential, or potential shale developments are occurring, you look at the fact that sort of in the same region where this salt dome uh, storage is being proposed, there's also a proposal to bring in LNG uh, very nearby. Um, you have to ask yourself the question, when would Poland move to a situation where they might consider you know, opening up that to sort of, sort of more market-oriented storage and, and offering hub services, which actually provides a degree of transparency in terms of price formation? And if you could do that, might that not sort of tip the scale in Central Europe to moving away from you know, what historically has been a paradigm characterized by oil indexation to one in which you have more gas-on-gas -gas competition? 
So I'll just sort of seed the conversation with that. And if you guys want to comment on that, please do. If not, questions from the audience are welcome. <laughs> I saw some nods, so surely some people have something to say. Let's, uh, it's uh, quite wide, but um, the, of course, it, that's me to start to talk about uh, energy security and a little bit wider than only about the projects, the covers for the storage for, for oil. Uh, the thanks to Pat, who, you know, who mentioned of talking about the gas, he also, you know, links that uh, with the oil. That um, We've been talking about the logic. Uh, but uh, I, I uh, had many occasions to talk about uh, uh, logic for uh, oil storages in Poland. Uh, let's, uh, once, once I think, for example, about, uh, let me talk about the uh, storages for oil in Denmark. Uh, that's, uh, in my opinion, a totally different issue. Uh, of course, that's uh, Danish to, 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 to decide whether to, to build that storage or not. Uh, but uh, uh, if I were them, I, I wouldn't invest the money on the such a storage. But Poland, in that location we proposed, uh, without uh, own crude oil, uh, and a quite a big economy, uh, the population nearly 400 million people. Uh, you know, we depend on uh, that uh, energy, uh, but depend on the fuel we should produce. Otherwise, uh, we are on a big risk with our economy being dependent on uh, France, especially from the east side. So. Uh, having that uh, uh, location, which is, uh, in my opinion, the most logic, we are very lucky that we have that uh, geologically uh, location, you know, that close to the sea. That's uh, uh, the, the best log logistic, just to uh, uh, the, the crude oil supply also. And we may link that uh, uh, both with the on onshore that... Uh, uh, pipe network, uh, or so, uh, uh, you know, created a better situation for our neighbors as well, that we may share that uh, around the Baltic, uh, the Baltic Sea countries, and, and also others. Uh, and um, that's for our economy, it must be the best. What is, a, let's say, logic for me, for my company also, we have that obligatory reserve on our balance sheet for the company. This is it actually 1.5 billion euros, about 2 billion US dollars. We may uh, invest that money for a better new businesses. So, uh, and uh, we want to go out of that trying to convince the government that's a better solution we do have. That we, that's why we want to present a better solution. But also, the EU regulation, the EU asked Poland to change it because it's uh, not a system which uh, is acceptable for EU as a whole. So we must change in Poland that within, a, let's say, starting to adopt a new model, a uh, new system for a strategic reserve, <clears throat> not later than the next year, end of the next year. So it's, uh, of course, not time to, uh, to let's say, to change all of the things and prepare the, uh, the, the also the um, uh, storages, but just to uh, um, uh, prepare the, the new regulations and start with that implementation. Also, starting with investment program, or we may um, uh, have the money friends for 
that such an investment, if that's uh, commercially viable. And uh, so mm, uh, that's, you know, the, the, the question. Uh, I don't want to, to go wider, but that's the things which is uh, really le related to the company needs and it's uh, viable for the country and the region also we may share something positive with our neighbors it means that uh, something logic for a eu region which are quite wide and may uh, create a better energy security system you know for others means that part of the european union which is logic that's also controversially a little bit to what's going on with the Gazprom actions, monopolization mostly. I just say, you know, I'm not going to say that, that, that you know, that we, are, we must do something like an enemy, you know, that. They are quite a logic. When I remember when I, uh, let's see, it was a time many years ago, <laughs> but uh, time is going very, very fast. It's uh, 1990. Six seven, uh, uh, I uh, was working headquarter uh, ABB uh, with a responsibility for the Central Eastern European region, power generation, and I remember that was discussion going on regarding the Primorsk, and the Russians was very open with that announcement that they are starting to build a new uh, pipeline and a new terminal which will be used for transport crude oil, uh, you know, via ships. So, and it, 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 you know, discussion from uh, many of the, uh, you know, let's say, uh, specialists, that, that the Western specialists, that this is something an economically, economically unacceptable, unlogic. Nobody will start that. So, we have Primorsk, and they announced Primorsk too. So Primorsk 2 is ready now. And uh, they announced uh, North Stream, and it's done. And now they already announced a week ago uh, storages for gas. Uh, and we've been talking about the salt storages uh, uh, and logic for, for oil. You know, because it's, uh, you know, for them it, it will secure the system. For us, we've been still discussing it about the energy security. That's the logic, and uh, I think that logic is very well known here, especially in the US, because, you know, you feel that without that uh, storage reserves, you know, uh, you will have that much, much, let's say, weaker position, so to speak, you know, the security level. So, uh, of course, we have to... Um, educate ourselves and to learn more and convince, trying to be convinced, stepping into the, um, uh, you, you know, changing uh, model that must also change our, a little bit mentality, you know, towards the, the such a uh, direction. Okay. Anybody uh, else? I'm, I'm not the uh, I'm the Paul Mill guy. I just make two points on on your question. The commercial side of it and the potential really intrigues me. That's kind of my antenna up. Um, with that said, I'd make one point: is EU allows its member states to store their respective petroleum reserves in other countries. So that that's kind of a market opportunity. And then two, if there was one place I, I would invest infrastructure in oil and gas infrastructure in Europe, it would be in the Baltic region. I'm bullish on the Baltics. Look, you've got Greece practically collapsing. The French uh, uh, bonds just got downrated by Moody's. W Western Europe is, is kind of struggling along. The Baltic region, Poland, the three Baltic states, Sc the Scandinavians, the Swedes, the, the, the Finns, Norwegians, they're, they're a region of economic health. And all indicators are they're going to continue to be robust. They may be affected by being pulled a little bit by, by the rest of Europe, but it, it's, it's a region of, of robust growth. And I think that that's something to keep in mind. Interesting. Anybody else want to comment? or?
Yeah, I got, do you, do you do you sense that the technology that is being or the the locations that are being used to store oil in a salt dome would be utilized for natural gas? Is that is that being discussed in Poland yet? Um, that's not only it, uh, it's being discussed. It's uh, that investment or, or already started. You know, to, in the same area that's the closest. Uh, uh, that's the, in Pomerania. Uh, our oil and gas company started with that investment, uh, the storages for uh, salt caverns for, for gas. That's a logic, you know, to have in the same place, you know, the storages for oil. And uh, proper, uh, it's, uh, you know, the best to manage that. And the cheapest also, in a way. But uh, it means that, uh, you know, we have the first step done, so to speak, you know, that, that they are not... Uh, Oppositions, you know, and that the, the local people, you know, are uh, uh, accepting quite well that investment. So, which is um, that is uh, already partially the uh, job done. That's a, I think, a common theme in in many places. Um, uh, is, is there uh, just a, is there actually any effort uh, among the the operators in Poland to do public increase public awareness about the benefits of potential benefits of various projects. I know that's something that, that happened here, you know, sort of concomitant with a lot of the shale gas developments that were starting to move forward in the Marcellus region. Some companies started to try to host town halls to try to bring the local community on board and gain local acceptance. I don't it is You mentioned some opposition by local communities. Is you know, that... Uh the same system we may use, like like we have to use for for a shell gas, you know, to convince it to, to have the, so to speak, the good environment as to all stakeholders accepting, you know, uh, that we step into that. And uh, you know, once I, I think that, that the big opposition is on a, well, let's say, political level, and uh, some uh, something like you know, uh, differ. Uh, well, let's say uh, treating differently the, the country budget, you know, how to finance that and uh, the, the whether uh, we may afford that or not. Uh, the, most of them are lying, you know, that, you know, that, uh, that uh, level, uh, not uh, in a strategic uh, discussion, you know, that it's uh, something which is a very viable, that's a long term. Uh, projects. It is not for one, two, three years. It's a 10, 15, 20 years. So, uh, Jersey, you had a, a comment. I didn't want to just skip you over. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing uh, that this legalization, which President talked about, is very good for us, for Perl, because, because our line, our pipe is going nearby. Yeah? <laughs> causes nothing for us. And second point, of course, our company has to react for each situation that can happen. Yeah? And for this, from this point of view, our NAFTA port, our, we have almost 70%, Lotus has also some share, can help us in each situation. If something will happen, from the Russia, having this project, and our that's we have no problem with deliver products on the labor which is necessary for our refinery. We have no project, we have no problem because if you know if you put a line, you can't move this. Yeah, vessel can come from each place all over the world to this place, close to Lotus. This is our reaction for, for a situation we can happen. And I think that from this point of view, we are safety. Uh, we didn't mention, but I think it's wise to mention now that, uh, you know, that there is an access existing already by pipes uh, for the two hour refineries, that's including the biggest one located in the middle of uh, the land the, the Płock refinery, bigger than the, the Gdańsk refinery, means that there, there is existing already connections. So, that's, um, for both refineries, it's a really viable uh, idea. 
Anel, did you have a comment? Well, I was just going to say, um, certainly in the areas that we're working, we're doing quite a few different uh, programs with the local community on educating. You were talking about uh, getting that information out there to educate and explain to the public what we're doing. And so I think uh, most of the operators are doing that um, as they begin to drill in the, in the shale gas plays. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I have a question to Mr. Paweł Olechnowicz and Mr. Jerzy Melaniuk uh, regarding the uh, caverns. Um, you showed in your presentation a great opportunity to develop the caverns in the uh, South Downs in Pomerania region. But Pomerania region is not the only place in Poland where we have uh, salt deposits. Another area is um, Carpathian, Carpathian foreland, a uh, region between uh, Krakow and Bochnia. So my question is if you ever considered to the opportunity to build caverns there in the in, in that region and if there is a good uh, infrastructure to um, deliver oil and gas stored in these caverns through the pipelines to the North Pole. Okay. They are uh, two, I think that uh, you mentioned between Krakow and Bosnia, it's in hotel, uh, got uh, geologically defined, uh, you know, area for, for salt caverns, but uh, another one which is acceptable by uh, geologist, it's uh, located near uh, Wrocław. Um, that's uh, uh, the Zielona Góra. Uh, uh, when must we, you know, uh, try to uh, to uh, to choose the best uh, location? That's a Gdańsk location, Pomerania. Why? Because you have access, you know, by uh, sea. And you have you know, also uh, the network already uh, pipe <coughs> pipe network already exists. This is a you know uh, uh, like uh, the, the, the another idea you you mentioned. Is, uh, you have to build from scratch. That's uh, absolutely uh, uh, you know in comparison to that one uh, I presented. Uh, it's a very costly solution. So therefore, uh, I, I didn't touch that. This is a, a well developed since the years, I, as I mentioned. So by also scientists, you know, that, that uh, France uh, you know, working together with us and previous with uh, other management. So uh, that place is chosen uh, many years ago as a, the best one, if any. Yes. Uh, my question is more of sort of a business or industry governmental <coughs> relations. Uh, I know there's a one company here, energy company in Houston, which was in Poland a few years ago, and because of the uh, bureaucratic, um, how should I call it, maze and, and uh, conflicts and uh, inefficiency, they simply gave up and withdrew. Now, uh, that the wood and as well mentioned about streamlining and one-stop regulatory uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, stations. Does Poland have any such thing? Are they anywhere closer <coughs> to being to that point than what that company uh, here in Houston encountered? Uh, could you compare the two if it's uh, comparable at all? <coughs> That's a question about that. Uh, no regulation in Poland do we have and uh, do we trust each other? Okay, that's a business relationship. I may um, give you an example. That's Grupa Lotus. We finish already the biggest investment program. Uh, mainly that that's a big engagement that said in the US technology and US companies, including Chevron. Uh, and uh, Nobody is complaining uh, for Lotus, you know, and a bad relationship. 
and uh, you know we want uh, we have a friends who wants to continue uh, uh, favorably uh, you know the, the partnership with us uh, therefore it's a, there are many many of uh, mm, uh, mm, different uh, examples maybe you mentioned the ones here I don't know that's one uh, particularly but um, I, I'm going to prove you know, we have that meeting today organized by uh, together the Polish government and Polish MBC. So the new era, it's uh, I would say, uh, for Poland is coming. We have the continuation of the, the same coalition. This is uh, something that we've been waiting since, uh, uh, let's say, years. We changed the, the political system, so that stability is coming. Let's say I cannot only answer on, on that way. So, uh, by by the, the experience, uh, we will um, uh, let's say start with together. Well, uh, start working seriously or not without any let's say touch, and stepping into the serious something. You know, will have no results. The previous many things happened which were not, uh, let's say, perf perfectly, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, mm, done and uh, I would say even unacceptable. But uh, even, uh, you know, we have friends they're talking about the salt covers. Um, I personally was very much engaged on that three years ago. And uh, two years ago I uh, decided to stop that. It was put it on the shelf that project. And you know, we upset the, the two or three the US companies. Uh, the France, our friends uh, uh, are well aware about that. But we try to properly communicate and ask them to wait for a better time coming. And Jan fully supported us uh, with that. And now we have a new the possibility is much, much better environment that we may, uh, that project uh, develop uh, with a government support. Yes. This question is for Pat. Pat, you have been a regulator at the state level over the oil and gas industry and then in Washington over the power or FERC or um, industry. And as, you know, as we are new operators in in, in Poland, one of the things that I think we're struggling with, and maybe some advice you could give to the to the Polish government officials that are here, is the the difference between regula regulation at the state level, say Polish level, versus you know one of our major concerns as operators is not the regulation within country, because the closer you are to the operations, the better you understand what's going on. No different, you know, is the regulations coming out of Brussels or the regulations coming out of Washington because it's so far removed. Can you talk about that and give some advice as a regulator as to, to how you would steer that? Uh, great question, because you're right. The closer it is, particularly with regard to this industry, the, the, the local and state, at least Texas, Oklahoma, the states where you have a lot of gas and oil production, the regulatory regime was, was smart but they were they were also very much partners and so they they viewed that this was important for jobs you didn't want to have the water be dirty and the you know things blow up and people be unsafe but there was an acceptance and as you get more to the federal level you get a bit of, of remove from that and my federal colleague here knows the same thing you, you have to you have to hit that balance they've got an issue, a bigger issue in Europe as you go from local to Poland, to EU, EU still kind of getting its wings. I mean, for those of us, I mean, I'm, I'm young, but I mean, the EU hadn't been around that long, so they're figuring out what they want to do. Fortunately, they actually, on a lot of energy issues, they made some pretty good calls. They wanted to open up the markets. They were very, the European Union, unlike probably the early stages of US, was very into an integrated continental market, which should bode very well for Poland, I would think. If Poland, like Texas, wants to be an exporting country, <laughs> Texas is a country, um, <laughs> <laughs> if Poland wants to be an exporting country to the rest of Europe, which I assume is obviously the case, then you do want the EU, quite frankly, to bust open those boundaries between 
you know, Germany and Poland to make sure that that, that gas pipeline is, <clears throat> is open, that the tariffs are not punitive, that they don't net back to the producer and hurt the Polish revenues. So those kind of things. Actually, I would say where Poland is situated, everything I've seen from what EU can do, I don't know the details of natural gas regulation across those countries, but their approach on power has been very much, it's been thwarted by the state monopolies in Germany, particularly in France, but um, they've pushed it nonetheless. They had a woman from, I believe, Spain who was uh, the uh, antitrust regulator there for a while who was probably the Margaret Thatcher of regulation. We all adored her because she was pro-market. She had a mean purse and she really went in there and and did the job right. Um, now Nellie Crows was her name. Maybe she was uh, Dutch. I'm not sure if she was Belgian. But um, anyway, she wasn't from Germany or France and so she was able to open up these markets. So sometimes the regulator can actually be your ally. And I think, you know, even ones that are really strict and trying to do their job the ones that are strict in Europe, in my experience, the recent experience has been they were strict in the interest of opening up markets. And so, again, that should be music to the ears of a producer. They're not going to get down and regulate, um, you know, how many parts per million your emitter machines are for compressing the you know, the gas inside the salt dome. That's going to be dealt with locally by either Poland or by some local government. We hope. I don't. Th- I don't. I mean, they're going to worry about the, the, the issue in, in Europe that does trouble me, and this is my last thought, is the, 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 the intense attention toward carbon emissions. Not to say that's not a valid issue. I'm not that part of the Republican Party. But I think, um, I think that that has driven a lot of policies that make you scratch your head. And I think that may be the only kind of darker cloud on the horizon for oil and gas production and transport uh, from Poland would be the, the carbon footprint issue. And I, again, I, I wish you well on that one because it's, it's been a baffling issue for us here that, you know, it's as hard as things are economically in Europe to have that extra burden that the United States is not assuming, that the Chinese are not assuming. Um, it's kind of a difficult one. But now, other than that, I think you, you could actually use the EU as a positive, but I think you've got to always be aware of the overreach from Brussels that we certainly have had a history of here in Washington and live under, I think, today. Maybe I share with you what what you already know, but uh, it's important it's uh, not a regulation. But, uh, you know, We've been discussing about the uh, reduction of the CO2 and uh, NOx, and uh, the, you know that um, uh, the, not to be polluted as we are, but uh, in Europe especially. And uh, it, it, I, I am very glad that uh, I heard yesterday in Paris, you know, that discussion started on the AEA level, you know, as, as a serious. And in, Ria- in Russia, that uh, poor. Uh, exploration, production system, so to speak, and transportation. You know, bringing out, um, uh, you know, that's from that area about 20%, uh, you know, the, the, of the pollution from firing gas, which is, you know, the poor uh, system in general. The improvement of the quality uh, in Russia in general uh, will uh, reduce dramatically uh, pollution. That's both CO2 and nitrogen. Uh, we know that nitrogen is uh, 20 times uh, uh, the more, uh, let's say, uh, damaging uh, our air than, than CO2. So that's man- there are many things we have to uh, bear in mind once that uh, put on the table as we talk about who is responsible for what and how to uh, improve the situation. There's a discussion about the coal. For example, we have a, a coal fire power plants with efficiency 34% average. Yeah? The new technology, the newest technology, uh, may bring up to the 44 average, at least 40. And uh, new coming technology may also uh, can come up to uh, the power plants to 50, 55 to 60 percent efficiency. It will reduce in CO2 by 50 percent or more in general. Uh, and the new technology is cheaper than any others. 
Um, so there are many, many possibilities. You know, that, uh, instead of a um, um, reduction of CO2, uh, uh, let's say uh, closing uh, or the investment for the coal fire power plants, the idea to bring the new uh, technology with, with a better efficiency. Of course, uh, the coal is not uh, the, the one of the, uh, let's say, topic in the energy mix. Uh, we're talking about the renewables, which is uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and it's uh, one of the uh, topic direction for the future. And the gas, of course, but uh, we should remember um, uh, NOx. That's, uh, it doesn't mean that the gas is, uh, is uh, not polluted. Um, uh, not bringing any pollution, so not clean technology, zero emission. It's not that. Uh, and uh, new nuclear uh, power plants, you know, that's a discussion going on after uh, Chernobyl, we should remember that happened, and Fukushima. Fukushima, that's once we can find kind of an excuse, you know, and convince the, the nations, you know, that. Uh, that uh, uh, energy will be, let's say, on a development path. But uh, what's happened in Chernobyl, the bad technology, and um, they are other not mentioned, uh, so uh, let's say widely. So uh, uh, let's say smaller, smaller damages, uh, or uh, close to that. Uh, this is a general signal that something is uh, danger for the nations, for the big populations. Um, and with the wave that, you know, even uh, more polluted uh, uh, with CO2 means uh, technology, and uh, something that may damage um, one third of the world if something happened. Uh, that it's uh, not easy to accept, you know. That's uh, um, uh, how to uh, how to convince the nations that that technology should be developed. I am not against nuclear, but uh, uh, everything can happen. That's uh, it was shown in Fukushima. Nobody even thought about that. Yeah, uh, and uh, we are very happy that it's not seriously, uh, let's say, finally. Uh, uh, expand that uh, happened. So uh, there are many things that we uh, we have to touch. Talking about the energy mix and uh, on which way we should develop. We're talking about uh, regulations um, on the EU level. Uh, you know, uh, there's going to be discussion you know, that we should create one uh, like a common uh, idea for uh, the, the gas supply uh, uh, for Europe. Uh, there's a question about it. whether is it that possible to convince all of the uh, uh, countries, you know, that may accept one hub system, you know. Uh, that's rather, rather difficult to understand, but by, by uh, let's say, such an experience like uh, we have, like Slovak, when, when Russians, uh, you know, stopped the, the gas delivery, uh, if they would have the uh, interconnector with uh, Austria, they wouldn't have n n the problem, you know, that they stop the whole industry for two, three days, you know, as a lack of gas. Uh, so, the, the, therefore, you know, such experiences is bringing us to a position that, okay, we have to, uh, uh, firstly, we have to think about uh, our nation, about our, uh, our country, our system, you know, but in a way, once we are in a common model structure, you know, the EU, uh, how to connect in which others, you know, and share uh, to get the better position if something happened. That's uh, energy security and not only energy security issue, that's a, in general partnership which are bringing us for, uh, let's say, better understanding um, how to uh, improve the situation through both, going through the some, sometimes uh, I am getting bullshit idea, win-win situation. <laughs> What's that? You had a question. Two remarks and one question is, first of all, if we discuss the case of location of projects like Sokovans, 
you have to take under consideration the what to do with the salt mine. <coughs> so I don't see too many ideas what to do with the salt mine if you go to southern Poland or Lower Silesia. So this is one point. Second point is that a lot of things which has to be done in terms of shale project like shale gas in Poland or soil caverns is communication with the local uh, community. So when I hear about Karl Kubacher going to a small village in Poland somewhere in the middle of nowhere giving a presentation in Polish, mm -hmm. this is something completely unbelievable, you know. It's probably w first expat coming to Poland speaking our own language. So I'm really impressed. And uh, of course, in terms of shale gas projects and probably in terms of salt caverns project, we will have uh, a case like so-called NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's great to have salt caverns, but maybe somewhere in the neighborhood. So. David, could you give us a short comment how how you deal with that in in states? How we deal? You want to know how we deal with the community yeah, yeah. Uh, in our development? Um, <laughs> uh, actually. Um, in Texas and Louisiana, we have had very good community relationships with uh, our developments, okay? Uh, I got to admit, initially, uh, early in the program, when we first wanted to do offshore uh, brine disposal, um, Louisiana had some serious hearings about this, and but we went into a major... Um, scientific program where we tag shrimp and, and Texas A&M and uh, Monique State, uh, we hired them to actually put shrimp out there ma and, and collect them and do actual, we, we paid the state to actually do studies and prove there was no environmental impacts. Uh, they were very happy with that type of thing. Um, it's It's been more on the initial environmental issues that uh, has, has been and we, and we do public whenever we do a new site or something like this we do an environmental assessment we have to have public scoping meetings we take all those comments and then we put out a draft EIS we do uh, pu uh, public meetings on that draft and get their comments and listen to them and then we go out with a final EIS uh, so we involve the public in that manner on new projects Yes, I've got a question to Mr. David Johnson about the caverns. Uh, I'm from the Embassy of Poland. Uh, mm, the first question is uh, mm, because the caverns actually, you know, they they wait for the crisis time. So um, during this time, do you actually use some private companies to 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 keep these caverns, you know, in a well conditions, in a good conditions? So when the crisis comes, then they are ready to to work properly. And uh, what kind of the companies actually you use when you, well, not when you build the covers, but later on when, when they are, you know, ready to use, if you use any. And uh, the second question is, do, do these projects actually create any jobs for the, for the local community? Or, uh, you know, are there profits for the, for the locals? Wait, the say, wait, say that one, second one again. Do, does what adjust? Excuse me? Yeah. No, does it create any jobs? Yeah, oh, jobs. The, oh, the jobs? The jobs. Yeah, do, do, are jobs, are local jobs created once you've got a uh, salt storage? Yeah, I mean, uh, just the, the general overview. If, the, if you have, because probably you involve some, you know, the, the, the projects cost something and you involve some private companies, right? And uh, yeah, so the question is if you, if you involve them, what kind of the companies you, you need to actually keep these projects and uh, you know do you do you create any jobs and there is another question about the um, about the cavern which you use for the gas storage i mean I, I don't know if you use any cavern no if not why don't you actually use what are the obstacles to to use the caverns to to keep the for gas storage we do not store gas okay we only store crude oil in our oil reserve and uh, uh, but 7% of the uh, industry uses gas caverns uh, for gas storage, and the rest of it's pretty much uh, um, 
uh, uh, what do you call it, depleted uh, gas reserves. Uh, essentially, they pump it in and take it out again. Uh, so we only use our reserves for crude. Uh, in terms of the companies, when we build a site, yes, we we go we go competitive and hire A and E engineers, uh, architect engineers to design it. We hire construction companies to come in and do different types of construction. We hire drillers to come in. It's all through private industry. Okay, uh, the ownership and operating is done by the government. Okay, yes, we do use a what we call management and operating contractor who mans our site takes care of the security, takes care of the operation and maintenance of all the facilities, and uh, manages the day-to-day uh, of the site. But um, in, in terms of jobs created, um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, the majority of the jobs created when we do the construction of a site in building caverns is more power intensive. Uh, in other words, we're just pumping water and flowing water in and out. And so it's it's uh, that's not that job intensive. Our sites, most of our sites uh, are manned with about 100 people um, at the site. And um, that includes security. Um, did I answer the question? Yeah, I mean, okay. okay. On, on your gas question, just a quick answer. Because most of the gas comes from, I mean, almost all of our gas is from the U.S. and Canada. There's not really a national security issue like we have with oil. And so the reason why we have used up to date to use storage for natural gas is really for economic efficiency, arbitrage, seasonality when you produce in the summer but consume in the winter. So there's kind of a different rationale for the, but the same technology but a different rationale. Question. I have a question from Ms. Bay. You showed in your presentation that interesting things pointed out that, let's say, between the time you spot the well and you sell the gas, uh, there is much longer period of time in Poland to compare with here, US, simply because there is no infrastructure, there are no pipelines. You also mentioned that, they, let's say, right now, there are like 200-something rigs, and you would need to increase the amount of rigs available to drill to explore. <coughs> Just from the pragmatic standpoint of the end user, let's say if I'm on the rig and I have a problem with, with equipment, I need extraction of the drill fiber, I lost something in the hole, I have a jar, I have jars to, to, to fish uh, something, I, I'm running out of mud because let's say I'm on loose out. Once I'm here, it's not a problem. I'm just picking up the phone, calling one of the service companies. They are, they are there, they are bringing this thing. I am putting on the crew boat or on the helicopter. I am heading on the platform. But Poland does not have highways. Poland does not have this service support, which I don't know. I left Poland some time ago, but I don't believe still that they have such a, a support, a service support for drilling like here. From that standpoint, how would you assess this exploration program? Because we are talking about everything, but once we get down to reality, what may happen at the time? It's not going to go by itself, it's like with the war. One, sh one soldier is shooting, the other one is bringing ammunition, the other one is bringing fuel, and the third one is repairing equipment. Otherwise, the war is still still. So that's a very good question, a very good comment. And, uh, and I would just say with that, that uh, I think it was spoken this morning, there are over 100 concessions in the shale gas uh, fairway in Poland. And so all of the operators together are trying to work those very issues, as well as, you know, there's a conventional oil and gas industry in Poland. And I recognize that the rigs are different. We've had to build new rigs here in the United States uh, that are fit for purpose for the shale place because the rigs that we were using uh, just weren't uh, viable for that. The same is true over in Europe and in Poland. But I'll just say that um, as we prepare to spud and drill all these wells, we work with the service companies to supply extra materials that are there. We're also working with the other operators who are working with the same service companies to do the same so that we can hopefully um, at least uh, drill these wells to total depth and and then be able to uh, move ahead and frack and, uh, and produce them. So um, I, that's a good point. And when there is less 
infrastructure in terms of the service companies, then that's something we have to work with. But, uh, you know, Tim Probert was here this morning from Halliburton, and we're working with uh, all the service companies to help provide those services. I have time for one more question. So. Yes, uh, another question from the State of Marathon, similar lines. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I, I'm a believer that if you have the, the operators and service companies come. My other, my question is, you mentioned flaring uh, during the drilling phase, and then during the extended uh, production test phase. Are you looking at flaring that gas, or do you actually have connections to the existing infrastructure? And then, if you do have connections to the existing infrastructure, so that would tell me that you've gone through the local uh, process of getting pipelines run to the existing infrastructure. And if that's the case, how does that environment look? And is there any real um, forward sort of view for the pipeline infrastructure for it to be deregulated out of PGNIG and open up more to the commercial market? Um, on your first question about during the exploration phase, yes, we intend to, uh, we think, during testing, get a permit to flare. Uh, and probably do a 60-day test. That's that's probably what we're looking at doing. Um, I think you saw the layout of the 11 concessions that we have across the fairway and then the pipeline uh, network that uh, runs across that area of Poland, and there's just less, there, there's just fewer pipelines. There was not, um, in the same area, a conventional oil and gas um, activities, which maybe would have laid that uh, that network had it been there. So it's not there. So I'll say, um, you know, we're going to drill the different prospects that we want to on the concessions. If they're close to the pipeline, we're certainly going to see everything that we can do to try to access and, and tap into the pipeline. But I, I think right off the bat that that's going to be very difficult to do because one thing we have to do is apply for these production licenses. And I believe you heard the Undersecretary talk about this morning that they're hoping to see how those will come about within the next two years. Um, so that is actually something we don't quite understand. Uh, on the exploration licenses, um, we do know that we, we, we think we know that we have priority then for those production licenses, but that is not perfectly clear. And we would have to have that first. I think, before we could uh, access and tap into a pipeline. But you've talked about the critical point, which is we need more pipelines, and we need to be able to access those pipelines because you want to look at that well and how it flows and how that worked. So did we, did we land in the right horizontal zone? Did we frack it the right way? Did we, did we drill the lateral length of the horizontal in the right direction? Uh, in terms of the tectonics and, and the maximum minimum stress in the area. So there's a lot of factors involved in that, and the only way we can really tell what's going on is to hook that well up to a pipeline. And so I think the discussion here today has been great about what can uh, be done in Poland to bring down the barriers so that there is more investment in the pipelines because they're going to feed off of each other. You put more pipelines in, and maybe some companies will leave and get tired or drill some wells or didn't find what they wanted and they'll leave. But now there are pipelines there. Uh, another company is going to come in with another idea possibly or another spot and say, I'm going to drill a well. And look, I'm close to a pipeline now. So anything, that's why I was just saying, anything to encourage the promise that, you know, hey, I want to drill another well. Hey, I want to test this again. I got another idea. That is what discovered the shale plays in North America is just constantly testing and hooking it up with another idea, and it's improved um, over time. Uh, please join me in giving a round of applause for the panel. Thank you. Now I'd, I'd like to uh, adjourn by inviting everybody out uh, back into the commons. We actually um, have, uh, have some cocktails that we can enjoy together and maybe continue the discussion in a more informal way. Thank you.